Hey Optimancers, Chris here. Wild Shape is cool, but there are challenges if you still want to be wild shaping at higher levels. The forum scales slowly, and arguably our best options are gained at level 10. This means if we want to make a character that focuses on wild shape, we need to make some careful decisions. I have done a whole series of videos leading up to these builds, so if you want to know more about my choices for this build, whether you're wondering why I took a particular race, or a feat, or a spell, or a certain multi-class, or why I focus on elemental wild shape to begin with, I have a dedicated video for each of these that I'll link in the video description. Today's build is fire. The moon druid blazing inferno burns enemies to a crisp. I have focused on this particular tactic in combat to optimize our fire damage that should really increase the damage inflicted. Now, I am normally very hesitant to present builds that focus on a particular elemental damage type, like fire, because there are a lot of creatures in the game that are resistant to fire, and others that are immune to fire. And so, what do you do when you face these creatures? The great thing about the Blazing Inferno Druid is we're still a Moon Druid, and we choose a fire elemental form, or we can choose a different form. So, if we are facing those creatures, then... The tactics I presented in this video won't apply to those particular combats, but you can turn into another form, or you can just revert back to Druid and cast some spells, and you're going to be just fine. So even if we're facing those kinds of resistances, we haven't put our eggs all in one basket here, which is often the case that you see when you see these elementally focused builds. So let's get into the build. If you enjoy this content and would be interested in supporting it, please find the link to my Patreon page in the video description. Patrons see these videos early and without YouTube ads. Additional perks, depending on your level of support, include an exclusive Discord community, as well as a monthly video callout, as these patrons are about to get right now. Airhead, Alex R, Vo, Brian Gardner, Chris C, Coral, Daniel Sturgeon, Dank Train, Dewey Cheatham and Howe, Douglas Reynolds, Eden the DM, Eric Wasserman, FBK05, and I'll do my best here. Sherman, Hella, Gishlife, Lightfoot, Hendry, Heisenberger, Jay Gemmel, James Mackler, James Sprague, Jean Baptiste Blanchette, John Matera, Jonathan Zucker, Joseph Van Horn, Justin Times, Lars V, Mark D, Mark Sexton, Math Guy Dave, Mr. Brett, PCZ, Pedro DeBacca, Ramen Goblin, Scott Parsons, Sig, Tazel, Thunderlock, Vu, and William Whittles. Thanks all so much for your support. Let's get going. So, obviously, we're focusing on a Fire Elemental form for this build, which means 10 levels in Druid, but in order to save ourselves the feat required for Constitution Saving Throw Proficiency, we're actually going to start with a level in Fighter. The race we're going to be selecting is the Plasmoid. I'll remind you that the Plasmoid was one of the races I mentioned that had some very weird interactions with Wild Shape. Check out my Wild Shape Races video for the details. But the quick summary is that, according to Jeremy Crawford, if a racial feature doesn't specify requiring a certain piece of anatomy to function in wild shape, then it technically works. Now, when it comes to the plasmoid, it is one of the weirdest races for interacting with wild shape in determining what does and doesn't work. If we just go by the Jeremy Crawford tweet, then it pretty much all works, which uh, creates some very strange things. So you should have a conversation with your DM about it. However, in order to choose Plasmoid, we really only need one racial trait to carry over, and it's probably going to be okay. So, it's right here. You have advantage on ability checks you make to initiate or escape a grapple. So, this build is going to be grappling. Having that advantage is a big deal, and that's why we're choosing Plasmoid. However, it is still worth asking your DM about the other stuff because it does give us some really cool abilities. Uh, so the first part of Amorphous says you can squeeze through a space as narrow as one inch wide, provided you're wearing and carrying nothing. So I would assume that if we were going to say this carries over to Wild Shape, then our Wild Shape form would still have like oozy traits. So if we were a bear, we'd be like a gummy bear. And the idea would be then, you know, we could attack and then we could squeeze under a doorway or into a crate through a knot in the wood or something and thus get improved defenses. The other ability that is really weird that is still worth asking your DM about is 
shape self. It says, as an action, you can reshape your body to give yourself a head, one or two arms, one or two legs, and makeshift hands and feet. Or you can revert to a limbless blob. So the question would be is, if this carries over, and I'm a bear, and I get a couple arms, does that mean I can pick up and shoot a crossbow to get a range attack? Maybe it's worth asking your DM and coming to an agreement about it. If you can't, it's not a big deal. But if you can, it gives you another option that you didn't otherwise have. Some traits that should be fine in Wild Shape are also going to be useful to us. Natural Resilience is going to give us resistance to two different damage types. As well, we're going to get advantage on saving throws against being poisoned. Uh, so that's all good stuff, whether we're in our regular form or our Wild Shape form. Extra resistances are always helpful. Now, eventually, we're going to be a elemental a lot of the time. And the poison damage, we're going to have immunity to poison. But we will not have immunity or resistance to acid. So having that, in addition, will be helpful to us. For our ability scores, we can start with an 8 strength, 14 dexterity, 14 constitution, 13 intelligence, 17 wisdom, and 8 charisma. The 13 intelligence is for multi-class way later on, but as you can see, by maintaining a 14 dexterity and constitution, the sacrifices for this one aren't too debilitating. We're achieving these numbers by taking the plus 2, plus 1 from Plasmoid, and I've put plus 2 in wisdom, and plus 1 in int. And we are really, really going to focus on wisdom here. I want to get my wisdom up to 20 as soon as possible, because we're going to be relying on it for more than just spellcasting. With a level and fighter, we grab athletics and perception proficiency, the superior technique fighting style, and second win for some bonus action healing. With superior technique, we're going to select the maneuver grappling strike, which says immediately after you hit a creature with a melee attack on your turn, you can expand one superiority die and then try to grapple the target as a bonus action. Add the superiority die to your strength athletics check. There's a lot of synergy with this feature. So the idea would be is when we're wild shaped, we go in, we do our multi-attack, then we can use our bonus action to initiate a grapple, we'll have advantage, and we'll be adding a d6. And since most of the forms we would be selecting are going to be large size, that means anything but gargantuan creatures are available for being grappled. Take the background of your preference and grab your starting equipment and you're good to go. And level 1 is not going to be great. We'll probably just stay back and fire a longbow and that's really it. Stay out of melee when you can and contribute a bit with ranged attacks. At level 2, we'll multi-class into Druid and we're going to stick with Druid until we get our elemental wild shape, which is going to be level 11 for us. For spells, I'd pick up Magic Stone and I'd use it instead of the longbow. It's going to give us wisdom-based attacks and wisdom bonus to damage. Guidance will be our other cantrip selection. Now we can change our preparations with any long rest, but probably my go-to spells would be Entangle, Fairy Fire, Good Berry, and Healing Word. Entangle hits an area, requires a strength saving throw by anyone in that area, and if they fail, they are restrained. Well, Fairy Fire covers a similar area and requires a dexterity saving throw, and anyone who fails, any attacks against them have advantage. So, with a big combat, I'd probably cast either Entangle or Fairy Fire, and it would depend on what I'm fighting. Consider the monster descriptions. Are they likely to have a good strength saving throw, or are they likely to have a good dexterity saving throw? It's usually one or the other. And you can often make a good guess based on the description the DM gives you. Once we fire the big spell, then we can use Magic Stone to add a bit of damage to combats. Good Berry is our best out-of-combat healing spell, and Healing Word is our best in-combat healing spell. With our second level of Druid, we of course are taking Circle of the Moon. This will give us Combat Wild Shape. This will allow us to Wild Shape on a turn as a bonus action, rather than as an action. And we can use a bonus action to expand one spell slot to regain a D8 hit points per level of the spell slot expended. And just as importantly, Circle Forms. This is going to give us the ability to use our Wild Shape to transform into a beast with a challenge rating as high as 1. At level 2 in Druid, this is really high. We just became the most powerful character in the party, at least for a while. And Wild Shape says we get two uses, and we recover them after every short rest. Now, I'm not going to tell you which form is the best form. I've done a video where I've talked about what the best forms are, and you can select the one of your preference. Maybe you want a medium-sized creature, in which case... Maybe you want to be a Deinonychus, or maybe you just want a well-rounded creature, in which case you want to be a brown bear. 
Or maybe you want the spider climb and web ability of the giant spider. They're all good selections. Maybe you want to be knocking enemies prone, then you might want to be a dire wolf. One way or the other, there are several forms that are going to make you very, very effective in combat. Here is the quick math on the brown bear. 65% chance to hit. 19.5 average damage per hit. Plus a little bit from crits, that gives us 13.26 damage per round. My baseline would normally expect that a character of this level should be doing about 7.65 damage per round. So we are 73% over the baseline. 34 hit points, and with a bonus action, we can bring it right back up to 34 again. And after a short rest, we can do it all over again. That is 68 hit points beyond just our druid hit points, just from Wild Shape alone. And this is without any spell support whatsoever. However, as we get into the higher single digit levels, we're going to need to rely more heavily on spells that we cast before we Wild Shape. Since our Wild Shape is going to scale very slowly, we're going to fall a bit more behind with each level that passes if we aren't supplementing our Wild Shape with spellcasting. But what you will see is, if we do supplement our Wild Shape with spellcasting, we can keep up excellent numbers. So I'm going to jump to level 6. We're now Fighter 1, Druid 5. And at level 4, our feat selection is going to be, this might be a surprise, Resilient Wisdom. Now, I know what you're thinking. Why didn't I just go straight through it? And then I could take Resilient Constitution at level 4. And the reason is our Wisdom score, which we just raised to 18. As I mentioned when we talked about ability scores, I really want to get my Wisdom up, up to 20 as fast as possible. And we wouldn't be able to do that if we took Resilient Constitution. Wisdom is very important for this character, for spellcasting, of course, but for other things as well. It's an investment in the future. If you don't care about your Wisdom saving throw, any half feat that allows you to increase your Wisdom here is fine. We're going to add one cantrip, and that will be Create Bonfire. So I just want to give a rundown on how this would work. So if we enter the combat, and we're not already in Wild Shape, and we're low on spells, and we're, or we're can maybe conserving our slots... Then we can use Create Bonfire with our action under an enemy and then Wild Shape. So here's a rundown of how it works. So we enter a combat, we're not already in Wild Shape, and let's say we're maybe low on spells or maybe we're conserving our spell slots. So what we would do is with our action, we would cast Create Bonfire underneath the enemy. That enemy makes a saving throw right away or takes damage. Then we're going to use our bonus action to Wild Shape. Once that target takes that damage, it's likely going to move out of the bonfire, at which point we're going to engage with the enemy, we're going to make our attacks, we'll use our bonus action to grapple with advantage and a bonus d6, and then we'll drag the creature back into the bonfire. This allows us to stack the bonfire damage with our natural attacks. If we keep this grapple locked, that creature will basically be taking damage on top of damage. In terms of spell preparations at this level, let's begin with our first level spells. We're going to keep Goodberry prepared. So this is going to be a healing spell that we can do outside of combat. We can do it before we Wild Shape, and because of the long duration, it will last through our entire Wild Shape. We're going to pick up the Long Strider spell, and this again will be something we cast before we Wild Shape on ourselves. And it will give us a plus 10 movement speed. And whether we wild shape into something with swim speeds or fly speeds, it applies to all of it. With a one hour duration and no concentration, this is a good expenditure of a first level slot. In fact, it might be worth a higher level slot if you want to share it with other party members who might benefit from it. We're going to add Moonbeam as a second level spell. This sets up kind of a similar situation as Crate Bonfire did, but we're getting a better area covered. We're doing more damage and more reliable damage. If you are in a situation where you can benefit from Stealth and Surprise, then you want to have Pass Without Trace. This again has good duration, so we can cast it before we Wild Shape. Pass Without Trace I consider basically a must-have spell for any Druid. When you have Grappling, and you have Dragging, and you have access to some forms that might have high movement speed, Spike Growth is kind of an obvious choice. Now this again would have to be right at the beginning of a combat, and before we Wild Shape. But if you grapple somebody and you drag them through a spike growth, those 2d4s add up really, really fast. Of course, we won't be using Dispel Magic before we Wild Shape, but in moments where we're not Wild Shaped, Dispel Magic is one of the best third level spells to have. 
It automatically dispels spells of third level or lower and has a reasonable chance of dispelling spells of higher level. Water breathing is a ritual spell, meaning it doesn't use a spell slot. We can cast it on the entire party at the beginning of the day and everyone will have water breathing all day. In terms of battlefield control, plant growth is one of the most powerful spells in the game, although it only works if the plants are already there to grow. However, in those cases, it is absolutely debilitating. It has no concentration, it lasts forever, and we can choose which areas it covers and which areas it doesn't. There is no saving throw against plant growth. So we have one spell preparation left. We are a fifth level druid. We now have third level spells. And the conventional wisdom is this is the point where you want to take a summoning spell and probably conjure animals. Conjure animals is the spell that does the most damage of any third level spell in the game. Like forget fireball. Conjure animals can do way more damage than fireball. Conjure Animals is potentially one of the most powerful spells in the game for its level. Uh, there's maybe some other contenders, but definitely Conjure Animals is on that list. But I don't put Conjure Animals on any of my builds anymore. And the reason I don't do it is because it's not table friendly. Now, I have a list of reasons as to why it's not table friendly. But what I mean by not table friendly is that there are going to be a lot of tables where Conjure Animals is not welcome. And if it's not welcome, then I don't want it on my build because I want my builds to be something you can play at any table and they will be accepted. So that is why you will not see Contra Animals on any of my more recent builds and it's not going to be on this one either. But I still want to use summoning to make this build effective at the levels where I need it to. And we can do that with another solution. We'll pick a table friendly summoning spell and in this case we're going to take the summon phase spell. This is concentration, up to one hour, one action to cast. We can cast it before we wild shape, and it won't use an action, it won't use a bonus action when we command it in combat. If we want to look at the damage that we get from Summon Fey, the damage per attack is a d6 plus 3 plus our spell level plus another d6 in force damage. So that's 3.5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 3.5 or 13 damage per attack if we cast it with a third level spell. Since our attack roll is based on Wisdom, that's a 60% chance to hit. Now in regards to the Fey Step ability, I'd be using this to bring the Fey in, make an attack, and then get out. The particular type of Fey would be based on your preference, but I'm not going to dive much into these separate abilities in this video. But one important note is that the attack is a short sword attack. So at least in theory, when you get access to a magical short sword, you should be able to pass it off to your summoned creature to get more reliable attacks maybe even a damage boost, though I won't make those assumptions in this video. At level 6, I would expect about 16.5 damage per round from a character, even partially made to do damage. And if we were to use the brown bear again, well, first off, our to hit chances haven't scaled. That means our chance to hit drops to 55% because we would assume that creatures will have higher armor class when we get to higher levels. So now we're looking at 55% chance times 19.5 damage for 10.73. Add another 0.58 for critical hits. And now our DPR has dropped to 11.31, well below the baseline of 16.5. Like I said, as we move up in levels, the requirement to use spells to supplement our wild shape becomes greater and greater. We have a 5 damage per round gap here, so let's add in our summon Fey. So we have 13.5 average damage times 60% chance to hit for 8.1 at another 0.35 for critical hits. So now we have 11.31 from our bear form plus 8.45 from our summon creature. And now we're up to 19.76. That's 20% over the baseline. This should highlight how important a supporting spell has become to our effectiveness in combat. And I'll tell you that third level is not the best slot level for summon Fey. We will get a huge boost by increasing it to a 4th level slot once we're of a level where we can do so. However, here's the cool thing about this particular build, is that once we get to 11th level, we're going to get our elemental wild shape and we can take our fire elemental form, we can employ the tactics that this build uses, and we can actually deliver well over our baseline damage without concentrating on a spell at all. So that's coming up. But let's advance to a level where we're just shy of that threshold 
to see how tough it is at that point. So now we are level 10 and we are Fighter 1, Druid 9. So we are one level shy of getting Elemental Wild Shape. One thing to note is once we get to 6th level, we can select CR2 forms. And once we get to 9th level, we can select CR3 forms. Unfortunately, our CR3 form selections aren't that great. And at 8th level in Druid, with our ability score increase, we're going to get our Wisdom up to 20. So preparations at this level, our cantrips haven't changed. We have Crate Bonfire, Guidance, and Magic Stone. And we are going to have Prepared, Absorb Elements, Goodberry, Long Strider, Pass Without Trace, Spike Growth, Dispel Magic, Plant Growth, Summon Fae, and Water Breathing. I've talked about all of these already, except for Absorb Elements, which I've added basically when we're not in Wild Shape. We won't be able to cast this when we're, we're in Wild Shape, of course. But when we're not in Wild Shape, this is a reaction that can give us resistance to a number of damage types. I want to focus more on the higher level spells we're going to be taking. We're going to have Prepared Fire Shield, Guardian of Nature, Wall of Fire, Transmute Rock, and Wall of Stone. Wall of Stone is a great spell in combat, but also out of combat. Which means that, at those moments where we're not wild shaped, this is still a good spell to have on our list. However, if we do get knocked out of our wild shape and now we're just fighting as a regular druid, Wall of Stone is a great spell to have for combat. Transmute Rock lasts forever, doesn't use concentration, and it is debilitating to creatures who get caught in it. Wall of Fire is great for a grappling character. We can double up our damage by grappling creatures and moving them in and out of the wall. The damage from Wall of Fire can stack up very, very quickly. It also is on point for us thematically. I don't know how much I would actually cast Guardian of Nature, but if you don't want to use Summoning, then Guardian of Nature is a possibility before a Wild Shape. It is a bonus action to cast, and then we would have to use our action to do the Wild Shape. That means we would make no attacks on round one. However, afterwards we would get advantage on attacks, and if we are using a creature that is using strength to make attacks, we get an additional 1d6 force damage on a hit. This can really boost our DPR. However, because of the setup issues, I probably wouldn't cast it a whole lot. Fire Shield is another matter. Fire Shield is going to be a staple of this build. So we will be casting this. It uses an action. It's going to last for 10 minutes, and it will not use our concentration. Let's just read this one through. Thin and wispy flames wreathe your body for the duration, shedding bright light in a 10-foot radius and dim light for an additional 10 feet. You can end the spell early by using an action to dismiss it. The flames provide you with a warm shield or a chill shield as you choose. The warm shield grants you resistance to cold damage, and the chilled shield will grant you resistance to fire damage. In the examples where I will be showing you the use of fire shield with our wild shape, we will be using the warm shield. In addition, whenever a creature within 5 feet of you hits you with a melee attack, the shield erupts with flame. The attacker takes 2d8 fire damage from a warm shield, or 2d8 cold damage from a cold shield. The main problem with level 9 in Druid is that the wild shape options are pretty much as bad for their level as they will ever be. The giant scorpion might be our best form, but with that plus 4 to hidden attacks, I would assume a 35% chance to hit on average, which is quite low. Here's how the math works. So this is the giant scorpion damage, and it's not that great uh, because of that 35% chance to hit. So the claws are delivering two and a half points of damage each on average, so about five points of damage between the two of them. Then we have the tail, it's adding another just under three points of damage. Then we have the poison, and remember that a lot of creatures are immune to poison, in which case they take zero damage. But assuming a creature is not immune to poison, we will still probably deliver no poison damage because the tail will likely miss. So when you see that calculation of 16.5 times 0.35, I'm taking that into account. However, if the tail hits and the creature is not immune to poison, then they will take poison damage. And the average damage you're going to roll is 22. But if a creature makes their saving throw, they only take half damage. Uh, so that's why I've done 22 times 0.75. I'm taking into account that maybe half the creatures will fail and half the creatures will make their save. So it ends up doing an average of about 16.5. But then once we take into account our chance to hit, it's reduced to 5.78. Add it all together, and we're only getting 13.71 against a baseline of 17.7. Now if you remember the brown bear, it wasn't that much lower than this. Uh, and we could actually become a cave bear now, which would probably have very similar damage to this. 
So be a scorpion, be a cave bear, doesn't really matter. One way or the other, our wild shape is kind of disappointing at this level. However, our summon fey is now doing some heavy lifting. We can cast it easily with a 4th or 5th level slot. Let's assume a 4th level slot. That gives our Fae Spirit a second attack. So now it's a d6 plus 3 plus 4 from the spell level plus a d6 per attack or 14 average damage. With a 60% chance to hit times 14, that's 8.4. And then we add another 0.35 from critical hits. And then 2 attacks means we're at 17.15. So our total DPR is actually the 13.71 plus 17.15, which is very respectable, 30.86 or 74% over baseline. The bad part is that our summon creature is actually out damaging our character. We are about to change that with one more level. So at character level 11, we get our 10th level in Druid and we pick up Elemental Wild Shape. This requires two uses of our Wild Shape, so we need to make it count. However, it has a five hour duration. Now, technically speaking, you could wake up, use elemental wild shape, then take a short rest and have your wild shape uses back. The issue with this is setting up spells. We want to have some killer spells already cast. And if you take the short rest, the best ones are going to be expired. So at this point, we're going to pick up an extra cantrip, take your pick, and we have one more spell preparation. And I like greater restoration. Then at level 12, and I know some of you have been waiting to hear me say this for years, we are going to multi-class into Monk. This is all about one thing, unarmored defense. We've been hyper-focused on wisdom largely because of this feature. Our armor class now equals our dexterity modifier plus our wisdom modifier plus 10. Now let's look at the fire elemental. So if we look at the fire elemental, we've got an armor class of 13 and dexterity plus 3. That means no natural armor. Unarmored defense brings us all the way up to a respectable 18. That is a huge jump, worth that one level dip. Okay, so why fire elemental? Why not earth elemental or air elemental? Well, let's go through the features. So the armor class sucks, but we fix that. Hit points 102, perfectly fine. Speed is solid at 50, and we're going to cast Long Strider beforehand, so it's going to be 60. Damage resistances to non-magical bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing. That will be most attacks we face. We also maintain the acid resistance from being a plasmoid, and because we're going to have a warm fire shield up, we will also have cold resistance. So a lot of resistances. Damage immunities to fire and poison, and conditioned immunities galore. Exhaustion, grappled, paralyzed, petrified, poisoned, prone, restrained, and unconscious. Dark vision 60 feet. We can speak. And let's go through the damage potential. So first, a creature that touches us or hits us with a melee attack while within 5 feet of us takes a d10 fire damage. We can enter an enemy space, and when we do, they take another d10. It's also worth noting we can stop in their space. Then, at the start of their turn, they take another d10. And we haven't even attacked yet. So here's what we do. Before we use Wild Shape, we're casting some spells. We're casting Long Strider, Fire Shield, and a 4th level Summon Fey. Now let's say we're going to be fighting an adult Black Dragon. So here's what we would want to do. Enter combat. We're going to move up to the enemy. Then we're going to move into the enemy space. We're going to make a touch attack. We're going to make another touch attack. We're going to do a bonus action grapple. Now our fire elemental has a sorry strength of 10, but with the bonus d6 and advantage from being a plasmoid, we have a d20 plus d6 plus 4 from our proficiency, that's an average of 18. The black dragon has an average of 16, and we have the advantage and they don't. So our odds of success are actually really high. So what does the black dragon do with its legendary actions? Well, the wing attack for an escape doesn't work because it gives it half its flying speed, but its flying speed is currently zero because it's grappled. So I guess it makes tail attacks. Then on its turn, it arguably can't even breathe on us because we're sharing the same space. Though if the DM says they can, then that's fine. We are resistant. But let's assume it multi-attacks. Let's see how much damage we actually take. So three legendary tail attacks against our armor class of 18, that's a 70% chance to hit, times 15 average damage, 10.5 plus critical, 0.45. So that's 10.95 times three legendary actions. 
That's 32.85. Then it's going to bite us for a 70% chance to hit for 21.5 average damage or 15.05. Then 5% chance to crit for 15.5 additional damage for 0.75 critical damage. Then two claws, 70% chance to hit, 13 average damage, 9.1. Then our critical damage is 0.35 times two claw attacks, another 18.9. That's a lot of damage. Let's see, we got 32.85 plus 15.8 plus 18.9. That is a total damage of 67.55, except we're resistant to all of it. We're resistant to the bludgeoning, the slashing, and the acid. So we're taking about 33 points of damage, less than one third of our hit points. So how much damage is Mr. Dragon taking? Well, we entered their space, so a D10 is 5.5. Then we attack them twice. We only have a 40% chance to hit times, it's not that much damage, 10 damage. So four plus 0.35 from criticals times two attacks, that's another 8.7. Then they're gonna start their turn on fire. So that's another D10 or 5.5. Then they attacked us six times with 70% chance to hit. So that's six times a D10 times 70% or 5.5 times six times 0.7, 23.1. Then we have fire shield. So again, they attacked us six times, nine times six times 70% chance to hit or 37.8. So we took about 33 points of damage and the dragon took 80.6 damage on average. It's grappled, it's on fire. And that is not including anything that requires concentration. If we have the Summon Fey, we could potentially do some more damage, though we would have to maintain concentration and we would be making a lot of concentration saves. Though they'd all be DC 10, we are proficient in constitution saving throws. We got a decent constitution. Essentially, we would have to roll a natural one. So 80.6 damage. Our DPR at this level, I mean, the baseline is 26.55, so we're multiple times over it. However... There are limitations, of course. If this dragon was flying, then I'd need some method of flight in order to do this. If the creature has fire resistance, it would take half the damage, though even half the damage is still pretty good damage. But if the creature is immune to fire, then this doesn't work at all. However, in this particular situation, we would expect to be able to solo this dragon. This is a CR 14 creature. We are a 12th level character on their own. Now on our next turn, you want to make sure to step out of the dragon space and then step back in. Now you'll maintain your grapple because you're still in reach, right? You got a five foot reach. As long as you stay in reach, the grapple is maintained. But by moving back in again, you will increase the damage, right? They'll take that additional D10 damage from you moving into their space. And if we do so, all the math I presented holds for the following round. So this is level 12. Where would I go from here? Well, the next thing I would be doing is I'd be adding wizard. I won't bother going through the spell selections. You know, obviously we're gonna take find familiar. We're gonna take a bunch of rituals, but these are low level spells. We're not gonna get too mixed up in the details. The main reason we're doing this is to take the war magic arcane tradition. They'll give us a plus one to initiative and that's fine. But the main thing we want is arcane deflection. At second level, you have learned to weave your magic to fortify yourself against harm. When you are hit by an attack or you fail a saving throw, you can use your reaction to gain a plus two bonus to your armor class against that attack or a plus four bonus to that saving throw. When you use this feature, you can't cast spells other than cantrips until the end of your next turn. This just mixes excellently with Wild Shape. This is not a spell. We can absolutely use it. We also have a limited number of reactions. We don't have our spell reactions, so something like Arcane Deflection is wonderful, and it is a huge defensive boost. Furthermore, taking two wizard advances our spell slot progression. So we now have 12 levels in spell slot progression, meaning we have access to six level spell slots. So if we do something like summon Fey, it will scale again, going to three attacks per round. We're gonna take two more levels on this build and wrap it up. So at 16th level, we will now be three levels in fighter. This is gonna give us a number of things, but you know what's coming. Obviously we get action surge. This is a really nice offensive boost. But of course, we will take Battlemaster. This is going to give us four D8 superiority dice, and this can be used to fuel our grappling strike, meaning this isn't a once per short rest trick anymore. We can now do it over and over again. However, we will get three new maneuvers, and I recommend Bait and Switch, which is a good maneuver for repositioning as well as defensive boosts, Precision Attack for that big attack you just really want to hit, and Ambush 
which is a really nice feature if the enemy just barely beats you on initiative. And that is the Moon Druid Blazing Inferno. Now to give you a final DPR number is really difficult because it so much depends on what we're fighting. But the example against the Black Dragon holds for those kinds of fights. I would also expect a Summon Fey cast with a 6 level slot to be contributing about 26 points of damage per round, and the baseline at level 16 is about 26.55 damage per round. So if we're doing any damage at all, we should at least be able to meet baseline. But you can see how much the damage can explode in the right situation. Now, if you can't play a Plasmoid, this is going to be a little bit harder because you're not going to have advantage on those grapple checks. However, ability to fly and things like that could still really be helpful to you. So this is the first of my Moon Druid builds, and I will be following this up with another in my next video. So for now, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, everybody, and I shall talk to you soon.